to this uh, book launch. Which, um, this is the launch of uh, this book, Kapitalens uh, Börsen, by Josef Vogel. Um, so, <clears throat> my name is Eirik Höyer-Leibestad, and I'm the translator of the book. And I'm also the co-editor of the, the series that this book is published in. Um, and my, the other editors are uh, Ulla Inset and Fredrik Willemsen. And the press is called House of Foundation. Um, it is based in Moss. And we publish a lot of exciting books. So please <laughs> check this out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, this series was launched in 2017. Um, it's a series of contemporary philosophy uh, translations. And uh, the first books that we published were by um, Giorgio Agamben, uh, Peter Sloterdijk, and Katrin Malabu. And we're very proud to now um, have Josef Vogel included in this series. Um, Fogel, I, I'm also, of course, really proud that Fogel has come to this launch. Uh, he came all the way from Berlin, uh, where he is a professor uh, of um, literature and media and cultural studies at Humboldt University. And he is also a permanent visiting professor at um, Princeton University in the US. And the book. Um, is in German, it's called Das Gespenst des Kapitals. It was, um, it was published in 2010. And uh, in 2011, it became kind of a surprising bestseller in Germany. And um, the book is um, a kind of genealogy of the um, financial regime, the current financial regime. And it also poses uh, a challenge to address to economists. Um, and this challenge is that while economic theory has in many ways contributed into making this financial regime, it seems like economists don't really understand what's going on in the financial markets. Is it fair to say that that is the challenge? Let's wait. Go <laughs> okay, might be listening. Yeah. Um, and I'm also very happy to be alongside Ebba Boye, who is the leader of uh, Rethinking Economics uh, Norway. She's an economist and also uh, an, a writer and a columnist for uh, Classic Album. And uh, Rethinking Economics is also um, co-hosting, organizing this event. So, a um, couple of more things I have to say before we begin. Um, so, what makes this publication possible and this series possible is that we have generous funding, cultural funding here in this country. So, I would like to thank Kulturrådet. Uh, the Norwegian Arts Council, and Fritt Ur. Fritt Ur also uh, funded this event tonight, and uh, Goethe Institute, and also uh, Norsk Faglitterar Forfatter og Oversetterforening for generous, uh, generous funding to, to make this possible. And as the translator, I would also uh, give a special thanks to Roman Lindeberg Eliasen, and Andun Lin Ho for their help with the translation. Now we can start. Um, yes, so um, thank you for going. Thank uh, you for inviting me. Yeah. So I would like to hear um, I would like to hear how this book came about. What motivated you to, to writing this book? <clears throat> okay, let me um, make some remarks before. I'm here. First, I'm very glad to have Eva as our partner here. We had a short conversation before uh, our appearance here and realized that she studied 
economics, economics um, but didn't talk in public. And I talked in public, but never studied economics. It would be a very interesting experience for both of us. You know. um, second, um, uh, thank you for uh, the translation, the invitation. I'm fighting with the mic uh, uh, until the end of the uh, session. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sure. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a gallon for me. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for the translation, thank you for the invitation, and especially thank you for the snow in Oslo, because in Berlin we don't have any snow. Right? It's a, uh, uh, a, really a luck being, uh, being here. So uh, your question was how, uh, how to come to uh, um, dealing with economics uh, in uh, as a literary scholar. I think it's uh, uh, there are two very simple reasons. First, if you look at the 18th century um, and uh, on literature uh, and in the 18th century, it is all. I think it's also good if you don't hold it. Take it down. Yeah. So if you don't, just oh, just let, let it go, and then she can listen. Can I take it? Yeah. Just let it go. Oh, no. Go. What do you think about this? Does it work? What do you hear about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's fine. Okay, thank you. So, once more, um, um, dealing with economics as a literary scholar, uh, I think there are two very simple reasons. First, if you look at literature in 18th century, 18th century uh, it is all uh, full of economics. Uh, and there are no specialists, there are theologians, uh, uh, there are priests, there are um, uh, writers who publish, like Daniel Defoe, on economics. So the whole literature, think about uh, Robinson Crusoe, for example, is full of economics. You cannot really, um, uh, you, uh, you, you cannot really um, 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 be misled to uh, work on economics if you look at the uh, modern beginning of modern literature. And there's a second reason which is very important for me uh, and probably is also a sort of bias between me and economists. I understand economics and especially uh, financial economics as a sort of interpretation of world. So they are interpreting our society, they are interpreting our behavior, they are interpreting our social milieus, uh, but it's an interpretation which should be questions in a certain way. And I studied interpretations, I studied how to talk about interpretations, so I was interested how economic economists and especially financial economy is interpreting our world, uh, is giving a sort of image of our world, and probably also a sort of um, um, of fake image of our world. Was it also motivated by the financial crisis in two thousand eight? Yes, uh, because uh, because you know um, uh, first um, uh, I have the impression, and probably most of you have the impression that financial economy is uh, determining our destiny. Uh, they are um, uh, determining uh, our daily life, they are determining our future, uh, even our medical care, even etc. So it's a sort of um, uh, power of destiny, which is located in financial uh, economy. And, um, uh, and the crash was a very interesting situation. Uh, uh, with the crash of 2008, I was in Princeton, and Princeton, uh, south of New York, is a sort of... Um, um, a, a sort of suburb of uh, New York, and a lot of brokers, hedge fund managers, bankers, etc., are living in their villas in Princeton. And there was a heavy traffic of helicopters between Princeton and New York, and you suddenly knew that there is something happening now. And then I saw on the TV um, the bankers of, um, of uh, Lehman Brothers who uh, uh, took their boxes and left the bank. And uh, being completely naive, I had simply the impression I'm now witness of something important to happen. And this was a sort of, yeah, you, have, uh, you are completely right, the original scene for my interest. So, um, thank you for <laughs> Um, so, uh, when I mean, I mean, I also uh, am baffled to see, well, to try to understand what's going on in the financial markets. It's uh, it is very confusing and very very strange in, in many ways. And 
Um, when I, I asked Google a couple of days ago, um, be a fairy, be aware. Yeah, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I did find uh, quite a lot of corroboration for an estimate of how how big the derivatives market is. And this estimate was that it is roughly 1.2 quadrillion uh, US dollars. Uh, a quadrillion, that's like 16 figures or something. Um, and this is 15 times as big as the... Worldwide GDP. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I will ask you, Eva, as an economist, how is this possible? <laughs> <clears throat> How is this possible? So yeah, the, the number again, the derivatives market might be worth 1.2 quadrillion. Uh, I guess, how, how, how is it possible? First of all, I mean, derivatives, people know what derivatives are. You know how many traders there are in the, in the audience tonight? Raise yeah. uh, your hands. <laughs> I'm, really? not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm uh, I'm not a trader. I haven't worked in the financial sector myself, so I'm not sure if I'm the best to to explain, but I think it's, um, it's uh, I mean, it's it's a financial uh, product that makes, makes it possible to uh, invest, to make bets on price movements, which is important because it's not only, you're not only betting if the price of something goes up, you can also bet if it goes down. Um, and then you can sort of put a price, you can make bets on this sort of, on the price movements in the market, on the volatility uh, in the market. And of course, it has some, as all financial products, it has some underlying function that is important. I mean, and if a finance book explains to you how if you're a farmer and you make all these investments for, because uh, you're going to uh, grow corn, uh, you you want to know that you actually that the price of uh, corn isn't suddenly going to fall in the future. So it's sort of an insurance that I will I will be able to sell uh, my corn in a year for this fixed price, and then you have security. You'll get you'll get your money. But then maybe the um, the person, but who's going to want to make that? But who wants to make that insurance? Well, maybe the guy who uh, is making bread. He's interested in being the opposite. You know, he he wants a, a low price on on, on Right, so then, um, so so that so that as and then of, so there is one line you reason then especially as as you write about it, uh, in the book you know, uh, when after Bretton Woods agreement uh, fell fell apart and we had the free flowing exchange rates there's so all this insecurity in the market for every I mean for every let's let's start with the real economy for every producer who's selling something abroad. And if the suddenly the exchange rate is going to fluctuate a lot, you'll be you have to you you can make it's an insurance making sure you can actually send sell your product uh, at some fixed price, and it's, so it's very useful. It's a very useful thing to do. But then that's the starting point. But then when you say the number is one point two quadrillion, fifteen times the size of the gross world product, of course you know this is not all uh, something useful. So then you can sort of on on that basis of something useful, you can just make uh, all these bets on prices because then you make the product, but then you can sell that uh, sell that product. Uh, you you made an agreement, you can sell that uh, piece of paper. I was going to say <laughs> you can sell sell it on and on and on, and you can make new products on top of that. And you can make new bets, uh, and you can and this is and then you can sort of step away from this whole idea of what it actually is, and you can make so many different kinds of products. So then it grows and grows, and you know, put in a whole humongous financial sector where with a lot of people who need to make up new products to make more money. The more products you can create, the more new ideas you have, the more new, the more, that's the way to make money. So you have all these incentives to just keep on Putting layers and layers, and then you end up at 1.2 quadrillion. Yeah, but I think there are some some reason for this uh, volume, uh, and uh, there are some investors like uh, Buffett, for example, who call these derivatives or futures mass destruction weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's very interesting that now the volume of the derivatives markets is much more bigger than before the crisis. But these instruments they are spreading risk 
in a way that the risks are not really seen if you look on the financial system. But what happened after the crisis, and this is important for us, what happened after the crisis was first politics of cheap money. Uh, this means uh, it was not only in the beginning a uh, housing crisis, a mortgage um, market uh, crisis, then a banking crisis, and then a worldwide economic crisis. It was um, a financial crisis which only could be resolved by bailouts. And then the politics of cheap money, until today, this means uh, zero interest politics, etc. Um, and there's a sort of, uh, and, and this is important for our understanding this capitalist system, um, there's a sort of double bind. If you want, in a situation of um, uh, economic crisis, if you want to create growth, uh, you have to lower interest rates, you have to put money in the system, uh, but, and this is the problem, this money uh, immediately didn't <coughs> went to industry, to production, to infrastructure, it went once more to housing markets, uh, to um, stock exchanges and financial markets. Um, and um, uh, in uh, the, uh, with the intention to create economic growth, they are now financing the next crisis because we see now it's a sort of international bubble. You have uh, rising housing prices in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in the United States, etc. And uh, you can see that the next crisis is uh, before our uh, before the doors. No, absolutely, and it's uh, I, it is very fascinating, fascinating how I mean it, what they did after the financial crisis in Europe and the U.S. But let's focus on Europe to uh, when they started this program of, of quantitative e easing and actually. For the central banks, they were spent for, for some months. It was uh, 80 billion euros a month they were spending that they were pouring into the financial markets to save uh, to save the market after the crisis. Uh, and uh, and uh, as you said, uh, so and where where does all that money go? I mean, it is to sort of stabilize the system. You don't want to collapse. If you have a collapse and so much of society stops, then every firm can't get a loan to, then nothing happens, it just stops. So they want to, to stop that. So they pour this money out, hoping that with a theory of how banking work, I guess, if you just fill the banks with money, they will lend it out. And then people, and especially firms, will get the loans they need so that they can grow the economy, which is sort of the economic theory lying behind it. Uh, but what happened is, well, if you have, if you, as Europe was at the time, you have a, a depression, the, the, the salaries are low, the pensions are being cut, nobody's, nobody's buying anything. So what kind of firm wants to have a loan to grow or to invest when whatever they produce, they're not going to sell their products? Um, so, they, so it didn't work. The banks couldn't lend out this money to the firms because there were no firms that were, maybe some firms wanted some money, but not the firms who could actually pay back the money didn't, didn't want it, and the other firms could pay back their money, so the, the banks would give them money. So instead, yeah, as you said, it went to the housing market, but especially just when held the whole financial market sort of um, helped, just, it poured all this money in there and inflated the asset prices. And a lot of it, yeah, went into other other markets around the world. And we will see what the consequence will be. Yeah. And perhaps uh, we should uh, add uh, one or two more points. Uh, so you're completely right to say uh, that derivatives, for example, are important. Um, to ensure some business sectors. Yeah? You can really bet on future, and this means you can, um, um, for example, the harvest of 2020, you can ensure by derivatives. This is the one side. But something very special happened in uh, after the Second World War, econo uh, economy worldwide. And uh, you mentioned one thing, and you also, it's, uh, it was the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Uh, this was very important because uh, in the beginning of the 70s, uh, with the end of the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement, we have floating um, currency. Um, Could you maybe remind us what the Bretton Woods Agreement was about? Can you please help me to remind us? <laughs> <you what? laughs> no, it was, uh, it was an agreement uh, which was um, uh, yeah. which was made in uh, 1944. Um, um, uh, uh, Great Britain um, 
uh, France, uh, United States, Canada, um, um, tried to design a post-war um, um, world order, economic world order, uh, and it was very important uh, to make an agreement just to avoid a crisis like uh, 1929, uh, an economic crisis with political consequences. And um, uh, this uh, agreement first meant that there is a stable or more or less stable relationship between the most important currencies after Second World War, and this means the yen, uh, dollar, the British pound, but also the German mark. Um, and second, that this system was backed by um, United States uh, gold reserves. Um, and because of a double deficit in the United States, this means a deficit of um, um, trade and a deficit of um, uh, public spending, they couldn't um, uh, finance this system any longer. And President Nixon, from one day to the other, um, uh, uh, as he said, um, closed the gold window. And suddenly the um, currency uh, began to float. And at this moment, uh, this was the start for international derivatives on currencies, just to ensure the um, international trade. This was the first step. Uh, sorry, it's a very uh, dry material, but I think we must mention some steps of this financial system. The Did, didn't you also say, we are in the book, that it was uh, Milton Friedman had a very important yeah. role in saying that the immediate derivatives is what is going to, now that we have floating exchange yes. rates, this is the mechanism that will help us yes. uh, manage this. Yeah, this is a sort of, uh, I think this is uh, the start, the very important start of the school of in Chicago with Milton Friedman, who dictated in a certain way the uh, basement or the architecture of the new financial system. And I think there was a very important second step, um, which is called the Volcker shock in the beginning of the 80s. The United States once more had a double deficit, uh, um, trade deficit and um, uh, public spending deficit. Um, and um, the winners of the international market uh, exploitation were Japan and Germany. So uh, Volcker suddenly, from one day to the other, raised the interest rates in the United States. And this was important because all the enterprises, all uh, their global com companies, German and uh, Japan company, companies, now invested in American financial markets. And this was the takeoff of international uh, financial uh, markets uh, located in the Wall Street. <laughs> And then the next step, you know, uh, uh, in the 80s, um, uh, the de deregulation of financial uh, markets uh, with um, uh, the uh, astonishing um, um, profits made in the 90s. Uh, in the 90s, it was clear in financial markets, you have um, margins of 10 to 14 percent on financial assets. Yeah, so these markets, um or these markets, they developed independently of sort of the economy of goods and services? No, 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 no not at all. Uh, uh, I think it's very important to see that they uh, transformed global economy in a very dramatic form. This means that these countries, uh, Great Britain first, and United States second, uh, who were the center of international financial markets, uh, suffered from a very strong deindustrialization. So the effect of the markets, of these markets, uh, is um, directly linked to producing industry. And uh, in the United States and in Great Britain, this was the beginning of, uh, we can really say, deindustrialization. And second very important point, uh, uh, now uh, against this background, um, United States and Great Britain uh, have the lowest, um, um, uh, the lowest, um, how to say, it, um, um, uh, uh, migration from the bottom to the top of all industrial uh, countries. 
Yeah. There is no uh, social mobility. Yeah. mobility. Yeah, the the, the uh, up mobility is yeah. the lowest of all uh, industrial countries, and this is one of the effects of uh, this financial economy. Yeah. Um, so one notion or term that has been <gasps> around for the past decade or so is is financialization. Uh, so what what do you understand by this financialization? Uh, yeah, there's, I've heard a couple of different definitions uh, around, so maybe um, uh, has, has a different one, but for me it's, it's really when, when finance influences and becomes a larger part of our economy and also into our, our lives, and sort of when, when finance stops being what we traditionally think about finance as being, as being an intermediary that just um, moves money from people who have it to people who need it and across generations and such. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, but I think, and there, there are many elements of this, but I think the most uh, interesting is uh, way of thinking of financialization is how it manages to extract wealth from the real economy and into the financial markets. Because I think we traditionally think about it as being the other way around. What is the point, what is the point of finance? Why do we have finance? Well, it is so that the money can find the good projects. Uh, people who need want to start a company, people who need, who need a house, uh, you know, they, they, they get uh, their, their finance. But what you see with the period of financialization from, from the starting, I guess, the, the 70s, but ex, uh, getting stronger and stronger is that that process is partly reversed, and a lot of it is taking money out of the companies. Uh, for example, a lot of where you see some of the examples are uh, like uh, car producers as Ford and General Motors in the U.S., where they now stopped, they're making more money from uh, the, in the financial markets than they are in making cars. I mean, Ford in 2000, I think the 2000 made more money uh, giving, making out loans to cars than they made money making cars. So it's become more financial uh, system, and so that's one part of it. But also this whole process of corporate buybacks. When companies, instead of reinvesting their profits into the company and, um, and yeah, on innovate, make more innovation, expanding, uh, you see that the companies become more and more sort of a milking cow for the interests on top. So the, corp the money, to a large extent now, is you buy back your own stocks to increase the stock value. Uh, I think the numbers now. Well, the Masonic and uh, U.S. economist, he says, well, it's, it's, it's uh, over 10 years, it's $2.4 trillion we use for buybacks. And that is 54% of the collective earnings of, of some of the top 500 firms. So 54% of the earnings were used to buy back the company's own shares instead of reinvesting into the firm. And then dividends, which is like the, the, when you own a stock and you get a dividend, that's something else. That was like 37%. So that's something else. But this is the stock buyback, and so the so the money goes the other way, and uh, and and then of course, what is financialization? Well, it is the financial sector becoming bigger, larger, and larger, and growing and growing, and with more and more becoming huge sectors of the economy and increasing as the size of GDP of, of the economies. May I just uh, because it's uh, it's perfect what you, you say that uh, I simply want to uh, add points. Uh, um, so my definition of um, financialization would be that um, uh, in this system, uh, all kinds of reproduction, this means social reproduction, economic reproduction, is subordinated to the reproduction of financial capital. This is the motor of all other reproductions first. And I think it was an important uh, step in, uh, since the 70s uh, that um, uh, the International Monetary Fund uh, and the World Bank, for example, and World Trade Union made um, treaties with uh, especially um, uh, developing countries to give credits only uh, under um, uh, very strong conditions. These are the so-called structural adjust uh, adjusting pro programs, and this means uh, the conditions, social conditions of these countries were subordinated uh, to the conditions of um, um, of, of, of banks um, and um, and credits. Uh, very important step. Uh, second step uh, was, and you mentioned it, 
that more and more elements of our daily life, health insurance, uh, pensions, etc., are delegated to financial markets. So our destiny is really uh, related to these uh, markets. Uh, and this is a very uh, strong intention of uh, so-called neoliberalism. And um, probably uh, the last thing uh, you also mentioned, uh, it's a theory of enterprises, that enterprises have to transform themselves to investment companies. You mentioned Ford, it's the same with General Electric, etc. Yeah. So um, financing the own consumers is a very important step towards this uh, financialization. So um, when you look at the, so the, the typical stereotypes of how this um, is this stock trading and, and how this is actually going on it's it looks like a kind of gambling ring that is largely driven by self-fulfilling prophecies and or i mean this is the kind of stereotypical um, uh, popular presentation of it uh, how has this become so influential on uh, the rest of the economy, uh, or uh, why are we sort of, how, how did this, um, wh why did we allow this to happen, so to speak? Um, I think we didn't allow it, it happened to us, uh, mm -hmm. like so many things. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and why can we change, can't we change it uh, like this? Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very simple, because it's uh, the result of a certain uh, enrichment politics. And now we have, you can simply say, we have two classes of people. We have uh, super citizens uh, who are not really linked to legal conditions of our nation states. And we have sub-citizens like us who are linked to terrestrial in mundane uh, situations and we cannot move. We cannot move our body, we cannot move our um, 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 our investments internationally. Yeah? So this is very important. I think this is um, uh, the change from a geopolitical order uh, directed by national states to a geoeconomical order directed by international investment companies like BlackRock, etc. So uh... Would you say that what happened uh, since the 1970s, the end of the Bretton Woods, uh, is a kind of new phase of capitalism? It's, it? Yes, yeah. it's, a, it's a new phase of capitalism, perhaps uh, the, uh, not the last phase of capitalism. I think the last phase we are um, witnessing now is the so-called platform capitalism, yeah? linked um, um, to Silicon Valley, uh, linked to uh, um, these platforms, which are uh, in stock exchange, wealth much more bigger than, for example, producing uh, companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would be the last uh, phase of, um, uh, of, of capitalism, the so-called platform capitalism. Mm -hmm. So what is platform capitalism? <laughs> what, what is <laughs> platform capitalism? <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, I don't want to, to monopolize. No, but it's, it's very interesting that these companies like uh, Google, for example, Facebook, etc., uh, so successful because they are not linked to fixed capital. They are not responsible for uh, employees. Uh, they are not linked to terrestrial conditions. Uh, and this makes them so wealthy. And this makes uh, uh, the volume of the uh, uh, actions on stock exchange uh, so huge. I think, um, I mean, a, a little bit the, the question about how, how did this happen to us? Where did it really come from? Um, and also, what, 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 how do we understand to, uh, this uh, how capitalism is today? I think part of the, yeah, um, I think part of it is we should look into economic theory and the mainstream economic theory that is, um, and how we understand our economy. And because, because I said earlier that fin financial markets are no longer just this intermediary that just moves money. But when you look at a lot of economic textbooks, uh, that's still the theory that is there very often. But you, it is you still look at, uh, at the financial sector as something as helping the economy be more efficient, moving money uh, around. That is sort of the theory in in most economic textbooks. And so it's a bit uh, stuck in the in the past, uh, I would say. And then not following uh, this um, the growth. And then and it's exactly because they are looking at finance as being 
uh, something that just makes something that makes the markets more efficient. And then you feel like we should, yeah, we should have more more finance because it's just making the market more efficient, making sure that people need money, get money. Uh, and but the another way of looking, of course, at financial sector and markets in general is that markets they aren't something that. Uh, the, the government has an important role in actually uh, creating money, uh, creating markets, sorry, creating markets, and deciding what kind of markets do we want. So that it's very, and what kind of markets have we created? Well, we have created market institutions where, for example, short term thinking is pervasive because we have this system where we have the quarterly, uh, you have to report quarterly, for example. The fact that we don't have taxes on short term financial transactions. Uh, that there are, you know, that it's, yeah, it's generally not, not tax very high, that we, there are no, not, no, no stop, that people can make this and uh, make huge bonuses in the financial sector, even though they're not really participating with a lot of new value to our society, that we are allowing for them to think that that's okay, just because they can get that money, they sort of deserve it. So we sort of built institutions where we, uh, where that kind of capitalism that we are getting is, the, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, that, because that is the market that we are creating and forming right now. That's that's what we're getting. But we, I think we, I remember that we could be creating a different kind of market. We can talk about that maybe in the end. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I want to go back to something you said uh, in the beginning about you were interested in how uh, this is a kind of interpretation of the world, right? the final finance as an interpretation of the world. And what you suggest in your book is that what is called futures trading is actually something that we should that we should understand very literally uh, like they're using the future as a resource for wealth creation um, and i'm wondering how how does this uh, go together with um or how does it come for i mean it, it seems to me that this conflict is, is in conflict with um, a kind of economy that uh, should become more circular and green and ecological. This sort of use of the future as a kind of uh, inexhaustible resource. Yeah. It's um, it's very interesting that um, um, capital and especially financial capital is a sort of um, secular god because capital wants to have eternal life uh, and capture all our futures. Uh, this, is, uh, um, and, uh, this is a conflict which goes back to uh, the Middle Ages, for example. Why was, for example, the trading with money and taking interest, why was it forbidden in Christianity? Because, as um, um, the theologians uh, of the Middle Ages said, um, capital, uh, and um, lending capital and ha uh, having interest for capital is a competition with uh, the um, uh, property of God himself, because God owns time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think in our uh, uh, Occidental uh, uh, observation, there was always a certain competition between uh, the competences of God and the competences of capital, mm -hmm. and up to now. Uh, so don't forget that capital wants to have an uh, eternal life. First one. Second point, if you look at the early theories of markets, for example, Adam Smith's The Invisible Hand, uh, there you have already a sort of uh, religious, um, um, a religious um, um, model uh, because these early markets and the description of these markets um, uh, claim to be as providential as God. So markets are sort of the realm uh, of God in our earth, in our mundane life. And these two heritages, this means markets who create social order and capital who guarantees eternal life is very important for our cultural perception of uh, this system. So market as a kind of God or providential yeah, blessing. Is this something that they teach in, in, in economics these days? Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's,
it's, it's an interpretation. I mean, the, the fact that economics has been defined uh, so clearly that it, it is the study of markets. That, I mean, you, you can think of what, what could the study of economics be? It could be the study of our how our whole economy functions. It could include how households uh, part of the economy. It could, in a different way, uh, in, in, include... You could think that included the, the resources uh, of the earth and how we are using them. That could also be uh, the, the economy. But that's not part of the economy, how it's thought basically as what, it, what economics is, that is whatever is, tr is traded in the market. And that's what you learn how to study, and that, that's what you're, you're focusing on. So yes, the, I don't know if we say that the market is God, but it's... Uh... <laughs> no, I was, uh, probably you can explain it much more um, detailed. Uh, when I began to read uh, as a completely stranger, uh, the history of um, financial theories or market theories, I was astonished that all these theories um, claim um, something like a complete um, rational order on earth, uh, which does not exist uh, in families, which does not exist in trade unions, which does not exist in hospitals, uh, but it exists in markets. Markets are the only institution where um, uh, something like a concrete rational order is uh, created. Um, uh, and this means equilibrium, this means um, pro providence, you can even guess the future, and this means if you uh, rely on markets, you can create a complete social order. And this is um, the original scene of liberalism. Modern liberalism means that uh, the more you trust the markets, the more order you can have in societies. And this is especially in financial markets. Yeah? So this is a theory, you know it much more better than me, which is called efficient market hypothesis, uh, created in the 70s. And this means uh, that the markets uh, um, organize all information, and that uh, the markets uh, capture all information, that the markets is a complete and perfect um, uh, information managing machine, which, when you trust the financial markets, creates something uh, like stability, complete stability. Um, and these theories, until now, um, are important in our universities, I think also in your universities, in universities in the United States. Um, and uh, uh, there is the simple question, what happens with crisis and crash? Are they really uh, 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 are they really capable of describing crashes and crises? And if you ask uh, the representatives of these theories, let's say, um, uh, yes, financial markets are perfect, uh, and what about crisis? We simply don't know. Well, um, I, I think it's, it's very interesting because um, I think within the economics field, um, in a way, it's it's looked at as being just. Um, it's not. I don't think. Uh, I, I think a lot of there are many economists. I'm sure that that would fit into that, that that picture. But I think many economists also are very aware that the markets are not stable. People are not rational. Uh, they don't really look at everything as being stabilizing. They definitely don't think of it as a complete stability. Uh, but they what they say is that well, these models are. Uh, very, uh, we need some simplification, we need to make some assumptions, uh, and this, we, we, we don't have an alternative simple way of making something so simple that we can explain it in a very easy way, uh, which I understand, but then it is uh, interesting how, especially because economics is, you have like one theory very often, that everybody in the whole world, the global, in the, all of the world have exact same textbooks are learning the exact same theory. So everybody's learning to make the same assumptions. And learn every, you know, everybody has to start with it. If there was one model based on rational actors and another model based on, based on something else, and then maybe you, know, you have to make some simplifications. But the fact that you're doing only that, I think uh, we have, have to understand how, how that forms us. As economic students going through our study, because we are, yes, you have all these, well, of course, there are all these exceptions, blah, 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 all these exceptions. And, 
the role is not always like this. Uh, but I think it is very easy. And you see that with the people work idea of them of the markets uh, being way more rational than they really are. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me add uh, something. It was very interesting how uh, mainstream economists explain the last crisis, for example. No? And uh, there is one general argument always coming in this or other versions uh, that first, markets are never guilty about crisis. No? Uh, they are perfect. So when there's a crisis, there must be first um, incompetences of some actors or incompetences of Politi politicians or uh, factors which, by the way, are coming from the outside. To give a, a, an example, which is uh, an example of one of the most prominent founders of uh, our neoclassical economics, it's William Jevons, uh, around 1900. So he realized that there are crises uh, in the markets. He realized that there are uh, different uh, cycles, for example, which must be explained, but they cannot be explained with traditional market theories because they guarantee stability, they guarantee equilibrium, etc. So he developed, and this is a sort of um, satir, satire, satire, um, satire uh, in history of economics, he explained crisis and changes in the markets, I will, can tell you, um, with the sun. He said there's, there are solar turbulences. This solar turbulence is called uh, solar spots. The solar spots cause meteorological changes on Earth. The meteorological changes on Earth cause differences in harvest, and the harvest uh, uh, create uh, turbulences on prices. This was his explanations of um, cycles and crises, etc. And I think this is until now the strategy of econo uh, economists. Uh, they are. Uh, some fact factors which are not immanent in the markets, but exterior, and these are um, uh, uh, the factors which are responsible for crashes, etc., but not the markets. No, it's uh, uh, many, many economic theories has exactly that, this idea that any, any crisis, the only way of understanding a crisis is that it comes as an external shock. It comes from the outside. There's... Um, most uh, none of the main main models that have been used up until the, the crisis, or as, and not as, still not as far as I know, don't. For example, you know, people who work now on the outside of the mainstream. And, uh, there were people working on, like, uh, I mean, using Minsky's idea, ideas like people like Steve Keen. They are putting, for example, rising private debt into an economic model, seeing what will happen in the economy if the debt, private debt, just keeps on rising and rising and rising. Uh, what is there a, a tipping point where people can't pay back? You know, he put that into, and he could predict there is going to be a crisis because he was looking at that parameter, the private debt. That was not, but that not, none of the main models had that, and they they were seeing it happen. But at the same time, I mean, I I I I, I hear uh, I I also recognize everything you're saying. Saying that's all like part of economics field, especially if you go into. I mean, the, the pure American economic textbooks, I would say that I agree with that description. But I mean, here in Norway, I think very many economists, I mean, we are, we are often social Democrats, and I think they have a different view of the markets. Uh, there's many uh, economists in Norway who definitely believe that we, the market need to be regulated, for example, and we do have very strong financial regulation in Norway, it could maybe be stronger, but we have it, and it's economists who are also pushing that forward. So it's not as, uh, but... Uh, yeah, but, uh, but it, uh, nevertheless, it's, it's very important because um, the mainstream economists uh, have um, um, the uh, intention to make prognostics. So they want to tell the future of the markets. And after this crisis, uh, one of the most important um, representatives of these, uh, it's Robert Lucas, uh, for example, he, and this is very uh, interesting to hear this, um, um, this sentence, he said, we make our prognosis on markets under conditions that no crisis happens. This is um, uh, uh, the, 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 the mainstream of economics. Yeah, and, and it is uh, the, 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 that way of economic thinking is part of like the master's courses at the University of Oslo yeah. in the macroeconomics. That is those uh, those kind of theories of external shocks that are that are thought. So, yeah. so you were both 
agreeing that a new crisis is, is looming, uh, that you, you believe that a new, new crisis is, is going to come um, soon, maybe. And um, what kind of measures would you say are needed to, to counteract this? What, what can we do about the financial markets? So we are no prophets, um, and uh, we are no uh, um, ap apocalyptic prophets. Uh, uh, it's simply, uh, uh, I think, important to remember that we have uh, these kind of crises since uh, 1987. Uh, the first crash, 1990, uh, the Asia crisis, 1992, um, the uh, whatever crisis, and then was the Russian crisis, and then it was 2000, the dot-com bubble, etc. So uh, this is not astonishing then the next crisis uh, will happen uh, in, in which way and uh, there is only one rule you can um, um, apply um, it's uh, it's very abstract it's to minimize the dependency from financial markets uh, of your own lives of uh, uh, national economies uh, and of uh, the societies. Minimize the dependency of, from uh, financial markets. And all instruments which are um, going in this direction are important or um, good instruments. Yeah, I, I think that the financial markets have the same... Uh, part of the problem is that they have, they have been become too large. You know, because they have this basis in them that is very important. We need financial, I would, you know, we need financial markets for investments. Um, and but it, when when a sector has grown so big and as you said has gone got into uh, every sector of the economy the, the way it has, uh, there are so many people there working in so many institutions that are always trying to innovate and drive new products and too many interests trying to make the financial sector bigger <laughs> bigger bigger and too many profits in, in the system that it's becoming that it's exactly starting to take money out of the real economy. Uh, so, uh, in, in a way, I'm not saying maybe it's not a goal to reduce it, but make sure that you have policy measures where you are not afraid of saying that, yeah, the consequence will probably be that the sector will become smaller, and that's not a problem. Uh, for example, I've, of course, this starting to tax these financial transactions, uh, making the short-termness, uh, having less of that, I think it's an important part. Um, but also to look... Uh, for I mean, for Nora's part, you know, to look more at, at the bonuses, to see if we have a whole sector where too many people will get huge bonuses from not necessarily creating value for our society, but extracting value from society, and they are driving, and then they are driving the, the financial sector. That we should have discussion: is that okay, or should, can, can we make regulations on that? But I also think that uh, we shouldn't look at financial markets just as you know how can we reduce them, regulate them, make sure they don't. Are, that they're not going to create another crisis. I think we also need a new perspective on financial financial markets, thinking about how we can use them, what potential uh, is there, and um, how can we form the markets in a way where we, so that money it go, is going less into the financial um, into the housing bubbles and more into, for example, the green economy. Um, so right now there's too much. The, the profits are too high in housing or in this buying and selling existing assets. So that's, so it's, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but that markets can in a different way be formed so that can become more useful. And it's important to have that, that view on it also. You, um, you say in your book that um, we also need a kind of secularization of, the, of, of economics, of the economic thought or ideas of the markets. Um, what what would this secularization entail? Do you think? Um, I uh, already mentioned that my impression is there is a lot of um, uh, religious uh, impact in modern financial market theory, um, and this religious impact is linked to the second observation uh, that uh, the most um, uh, the, 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 the most holy aspect or, or holy uh, segment of these theories is mathematics and physics. This means uh, there is the idea that markets work um, under the dictate of physical laws. 
Uh, this is, I think, uh, very important. In the 19th, in, in the 18th century, it was Newtonian physics. In the uh, 19th century, it was thermodynamics, and now it's stochastics. But it's always a certain development of physics, which with which, with which um, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the economics try to interpret markets. Uh, and when I talk about secularization, I first uh, um, uh, 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 formulate the thesis that social processes cannot be described by physical or physical laws. Mm -hmm. First, second, if we treat with a series of payments, if we treat with uh, economic relationship, we um, move in uh, the landscape of history. And this means there is no perfect future. This is an open future. This is contingency. This is hazard, chance, etc. And you cannot uh, um, determine these events by physical or religious, whatever, laws of providence. So secularization simply means to um, introduce um, social movements and historical movements in the observation of economic, uh, economic facts. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, economics. It's not a branch of mathematics or physics. It's a branch of history and sociology. And I think uh, one of the people who will agree with you there is actually Andrew Haldane, who is the chief economist of the Bank of England. Uh, and he wrote in the foreword to the book Economocracy, which we think economics uh, published in the UK. He wrote. He writes that mainstream economic models have sacrificed too much realism at the altar of mathematical purity. As a profession, economics has become too much of a methodological monoculture. And it's this monoculture that, they say fail, that he says failed during the crisis, um, and also how it is pervasive into the curriculum of the universities. And this has generated an ever greater focus on the mathematical gymnastics of optimizing models, and too little focus on the everyday aerobics of how economy functions. <laughs> Support there. <laughs> you, you also think that uh, literary theory should be part of the curriculum for economists? Uh, well, I would say yes, but then I think I would be accused of saying uh, we have to have everything in the economics curriculum because yeah, there's a lot of stuff I want in the <laughs> economics curriculum. So I think uh, economic uh, history, you know, would be the, the first. That we, the fact that economic students aren't don't have to take or well, some places they do, but very often they don't have to study economic history. So the history of the Norway's economic history is not on the curriculum, for example. But also just the history of economic history of economic thought, going through the different theories, and so you understand the different processes that ideas have before, and then you understand what are the dominating theories today, and then maybe also you dare to question them because you see that they are moving. Um, but also, you know, more I would say to learn more from all the other fields of from philosophy and from and social sciences and sociology and literary, but there's not room for everybody, everything, but more um, more of a mix at least, yeah. Do you think you could get this on the curriculum of economics <laughs> in, in Norway? We would be very grateful. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I think we're pretty far away from it. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, we're, we're working now on um, more, more history of economic thought, and that's not easy in itself, so. But uh, you must know, and it's the same, I think, in Norway than in, uh, as in Germany, there are a lot of students of uh, economics uh, which are not really satisfied by what is uh, on the program. Uh, this means uh, now we have uh, organizations of heterodox uh, economics, and these are students who simply want that the old guys are disappearing. <laughs> no, I mean, we, so we have Rethink Economics uh, Norway here, we have five local groups around the different Norwegian universities. It's uh, around the world, uh, we have uh, 50 groups in 24 countries. Uh, but, but yeah, in Germany they have their own organization, which is huge. It's, yep. I don't know how many local groups, I'm guessing maybe 50, just in yep. Germany, they're everywhere and they're very powerful. And they have a very interesting website called Exploring Economics, where you can go and just read about all different economic theories that are out there. And yeah, so it's definitely becoming a very powerful student movement. So we'll see that where that gets us. I think maybe it's time to open up 
to, uh, yeah, to the audience. If anyone here has a question, yes? <clears throat> Very difficult question and good question. Um, I would say um, uh, yes and no. I think, uh, uh, which is very important, uh, that uh, um, uh, for these financial markets um, and the problems and questions that arise, there are no national solutions. I think this is important. You can uh, deal with these problems only in international cooperation. Uh, and even if the, the EU, for example, is responsible for uh, austerity politics, uh, for example, against Greece, against Spain, against Portugal, mm -hmm. it can be and it's the only place where uh, alternative politics can be developed. Mm -hmm. I think. There's another double bind. I told only uh, already one double bind uh, uh, between growth and uh, zero uh, interest politics. It's an economic double bind. And there's a political double bind, which would be uh, globalization on the one hand and nation state on the other hand. This cannot be the solution. This is the wrong opposition. There are only international solutions for international problems. No, it's, it's a, it's and, and, uh, sorry for that. Uh, and I think that even Brexit is an effect of international um, uh, financial economy. Uh, and even some kinds of populism uh, are the effect of um, um, financial or uh, international financial economy, but not the solution. And, and it is also interesting how, when we talk about Brexit, how the city of London, the financial center of London, um, where have, there's, there's no doubt that there's a lot of, being gone, a lot of money from there into yeah. the Brexit campaign, yeah. uh, because uh, the EU is uh, pretty, you know, in, doing some ha pretty harsh regulations on financial markets, yeah. and when, especially when it comes to placing money in um, tax havens, you know, stuff like that, the EU was pushing that agenda, and City of London didn't want that. Uh, so I mean, so that there are interests here that are saying that the EU is pushing too hard. But on the other hand, of course, the whole idea of the EU is the free flow of, of, of capital. So yeah, it's uh, <laughs> two sided. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, I wonder. If, well, what do you think of the Folger reform in Switzerland? Of Folger reform initiative of having. 100% capital coverage for money issue. Yeah, so um, I mean, there, there's, there's an, uh, a campaign happening uh, around Europe, uh, you know, of an organization called Positive Money in the in the UK and Google paying it, paying it, for example, in Denmark, uh, who are pointing out the fact that, well, to the, in today's world, um, Banks are the ones creating all the money. Uh, whenever you're taking out a loan in the bank and you get that loan, the bank creates new money into the economy, and that's how new economy comes into uh, into how that's how new money comes into the economy. It's not a central bank at all that decides the amount of money or where the money is going. So the, they they decide how much money is being uh, created, and then of course also where that new money is going, where the economy is going. Uh, so, especially after the financial crisis and you have the quantitative of easing, um, a, a lot of people uh, started saying that shouldn't we take back sort of the control of the, uh, of the money? I mean, that is what they were doing, right? In Switzerland? They were saying... Money creation from the central bank. Yeah, so they, want, they wanted then instead that we should go, that we should be what the what the economic theory sort of says today. So if you read like an economic textbook, you very often get the idea that it is the central bank that decides the amount of money. And so everyone's much saying, let's go back to the textbook, <laughs> not for how it's actually working in the real world right now. Uh, I think it's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I think um, especially when it's about moving into a green economy, because the problem banks are creating money, then banks 
then a lot of money is going into consumption into the private sector. Uh, but when if 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 you take away that ability, so you reduce the, how much loans the, money, the banks can give out, then in the, then there's more room in the economy for the state to use more money, and maybe the state can loan out money instead, for example, through an institution, and make sure the money then goes more into the green projects, and more into welfare, and not just into consumption. So there's some interesting ideas how, here about how we can really organize our economy in a very different uh, way. Uh, but it's also a bit scary because our whole economies now are so dependent on this access to liquidity of money. So what happens if there is just if the banks are controlling, if the state is controlling it too much, and there's just you know how do you find the perfect amount? I'm, I'm I haven't really figured out yet, but it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> may, may I add something uh, because uh, I think it was very interesting to see that until the 90s, for example, uh, central banks were responsible for creating money and liquidity. Uh, and since the takeoff of financial markets, this uh, right, uh, I would say, sovereign right of creating money and liquidity uh, wandered from central banks to financial markets uh, and created a complete new situation that uh, central banks are no longer able to control the uh, amount, the volume of liquidity or money uh, circulating. Uh, first point. Second, I think there was always uh, the interest to create a system which could be an alternative to an uh, Anglo-Saxon or American system of international finance. Mm. And uh, it is a pity that uh, all these um, uh, attempts didn't succeed. The most prominent was the foundation of Banco uh, del Sur, uh, for example, in uh, South America, who tried to make an international financial system, Brazil, Venezuela, Mexico, etc., against or as an alternative to the American system, and it failed. And there's only one, but I would say very black and very sad alternative now, it's the new uh, foundation of uh, China. Uh, the international, the Bank for uh, uh, International Financing of um, the East Asia, uh, which is the only one which I think in some years or some decades would be an alternative to this American system. I think it's very, what's happening in China is very interesting. I heard something that I haven't gotten confirmed yet, but maybe you can all help me f figure this out. Yeah. But that exactly when we were talking about how, like, I was talking about quantitative easing, how we, after crisis, the central banks would just try desperately and they just pour money into the banks, hoping it will end out and just fuel the, the financial assets. Well, China did the opposite. Uh, they, in, in a different way, are using more the central bank directly to and go into inf green infrastructure. Uh, green infrastructure, but yeah. also financing projects in Africa. Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, China is the most interesting investor in Africa, um, and uh, from uh, um, um, uh, little credits to huge investment programs. Yeah. Uh, and I think the end of the American empire would, uh, would be decided in Africa. Hmm. Yes, there was a question. Right there, first. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I have um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this difference between making money and creating value. Mm. And I think that is the dif difference you were re referring to about the difference between the financial systems and what we call the real world. And I really jumped when you said that the financial markets are worth $1.2 trillion. Because you were talking about the reverse capital flows of money flowing out of the real world, the, the, the world where money creates value, where value is created, and over towards the sector that is only creating money. And money in itself has no value, except it acts as a proxy for what we can buy with it. But if no value is created, then there's nothing to buy. And the only way that money will then give us value is if somebody wants to invest it in something like derivatives. And then I wonder, please explain that number of 1.2 trillion. Is that the turnover in a year? Or is it the balance value of all the derivatives sitting on top of each other making that part? Yeah, I guess this also is a question of the, yeah, how, how do we draw a line between real and fictitious values? When we have 1.2 quadrillion dollars, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a very interesting mm -hmm. uh, book right now. Uh, it's called The Value of Everything by Mariano Mazzucato. 
I highly recommend it. And it's interesting how she, that's an idea of where value comes from. You see, like the old classical economists, for example, who had a you know who had a different idea of value, and you had, of course, uh, Marx, where the, the value came from how much uh, the work put into a product, and then through like these um, um, the the marginalist and the uh, what you were explaining uh, earlier how how the economic uh, shifted when when it also became more uh, like inspiration from the uh, from physics. It also was a change in how you look at value in, in economics, and it became closer to the uh, looking simply at, at the price. Um, and where it is the, the, the price that you can get in the market and, and the demand for, for, for the good that, in, that, in the, that determines the, the value. And I think it's, this is very important, this is very important because it says something about. Um, if you just if you just follow like basic basic economic theory, you just sort of get the idea. Whatever is getting a high price has high value, or whatever is getting high profit has a high value, and it makes the financial sector look very important to an economy. And, it, um, and I mean, up, up until nineteen sixties, uh, it was for example, you didn't count uh, finance as part of GDP. Because they, everybody agreed that doesn't create value. That's just an intermediary, uh, and that that notion has changed very much. Into, that it's idea that it is creating money. Um, but then the question is, yeah, what kind of value? But then if we need a new discussion about value. Just the fact that it has a high price is does that mean that it has value, uh, or is it just some demand? Yeah. If I can follow up, uh, I did an analysis saying that every house in Mals had appreciated by ten thousand children a month. Here. And that's a hell of a lot of value that has come in, but I see there's only price. But the houses in Malta are no more useful than before. Mm -hmm. The yeah. value has stayed the same, the price has gone up, and what you have is asset price inflation. But back to that 1.2 per billion, what is it? I, I was trying to get away from that question. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, uh, let me make, uh, make it uh, short. Um, so, for uh, a capitalist um, system, the difference between value and price doesn't make any sense. Uh, this is uh, also in the analysis of uh, Marx. Uh, you see that uh, uh, the price is the value. And if you, and I think this uh, uh, would be an interesting answer, or I would say a question back to you. If you ask the question of value against the question of price, you have to ask the question of uh, uh, the existence of capitalism. Um, and you cannot uh, rescue values against a system in which values are absorbed and totally absorbed by the question of prices and by, by the movement of prices. So once more, uh, in our system, this difference doesn't make any uh, sense, any theoretical sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes only sense if you uh, see um, in this or another way an end of capitalism, then you can ask the question of value. Like Marx did it, you mentioned it, with uh, the question of labor, for example. With the question of labor for Marx, capitalism has to come to an end. But just a quick response to your question about uh, the housing market in Moss and why those asset prices have rise so much. You know that that's so, mainly because of the bank's ability to create new money, and, and that is where the money is being put right now, is in the housing market and inflating the asset prices in, in the housing market. So that's why the price goes up for the value without there being. I have a, a lot of questions. I don't even know where to begin. Um, but first, uh, I wanted to bring up that uh, with, with Jevons is a sunspot theory. Well, actually, to him, it was an intrinsic variable. It wasn't an extrinsic. It became in, in extrinsic when you look at modern economists uh, post 1900s. Yeah. But that's not just neoclassical economists, it's also with heterodox economists. So you have like Keynes with animal spirits, right? He saw these things as externally affecting the market because they don't affect the market model fundamentals. Uh, second, when it comes to the marginalists, which you call the neoclassical economists, uh, I, I think that uh, you're just slightly misinterpreting it a little bit because they, they brought up subjective utility as a way to kind of account for certain paradoxes that exist in economic theory. 
and a lot of the classical economists actually focus more on exchange value because and the other thing I want to bring up is um, you you mentioned Bretton Woods as sort of being maybe something that offered us a way to peg currencies to something fixed and then post Bretton Woods it allowed for free floating exchange rates but even then you still have a reference point for something to peg a currency to like the US dollar. So my question becomes, uh, at least this one, I'd love to talk more later. Uh, why do you think that a fixed uh, currency is better than floating? And should we go back to a gold standard? No, uh, not to go on. I think the gold standard never existed in, uh, in this way. Uh, the gold standard, even in Bretton Woods Agreement, was a fiction in a certain way. Um, and only shows that uh, some fictions are probably more, uh, very important for uh, the functioning uh, of, of economy. I simply wanted to explain how the volume of international financial markets uh, uh, exploded. And there, the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement was an important uh, moment. But nothing more. Uh, not uh, Bretton Woods Agreement doesn't have any moral uh, advantage. Uh, perhaps one difference, and, and this is, uh, I think, an important difference. Um, after the Second World War, um, uh, even liberalist, capitalist empires and states decided that they have to um, uh, uh, tame capitalism to, uh, to um, uh, what's that, um, uh, prevent. Uh, prevent, to prevent another crisis like 1929. I think this was very important that capitalist countries after the Second World War created something like a welfare state uh, ideology. Uh, in Germany, it was uh, the social market uh, theory, for example. I think this was a consensus between Great Britain, United States, Germany, France, that capitalism must be tamed to prevent crisis like the pre-war crisis. In the 70s and 80s, I think, this compromise was cancelled and one realized, Thatcher in the uh, UK and uh, Reagan in the United States, that this system um, can uh, bear much more misery as we thought. And this uh, was, I think, this was a big, uh, makes a difference, but not the Bretton Woods Agreement. Uh, and I think we have uh, the uh, the meltdown of uh, the social uh, uh, welfare states in all our uh, countries. Uh, and this consensus, I think, was cancelled in the 70s, I would at least, uh, at last at the 80s. And this makes a difference. Okay, because I guess in the talk, it kind of sounded like you were implying that in post Brian Woods, and, you know, after the 1970s, there was a sort of neoliberal agenda that allowed us to kind of create more derivatives, uh, which also seemed, I don't know if, I couldn't tell that there's no distinction on the stage between derivatives and futures, but you know, there's multiple types of different derivatives. You could even argue that the US dollar uh, pre Bretton Woods was a derivative, right? Um, so I, I guess I, I get kind of confused in what, should we not have a fiat system? What should we do forward? We should just, uh, are you proposing something like similar to MMT, modern monetary theory, uh, where we continue to have a, a fiat system, but we just, uh, circulate or redistribute the money differently uh you know because you kept pointing towards this idea that capitalism is uncontrolled because we have nothing fixed mm -hmm. to point it on to <clears throat> let me put it very simply so i think um, um the right to create money uh, and uh, the com competence uh, to uh, control liquidity was since uh, uh, the end of the middle ages a prerogative of sovereign states um, and we can see how this prerogative, this means sovereign power, went from uh, national states and even corporations like the EU to private markets. And this means a special kind of political power which consists in creating money and creating economic situations with this money is only exercised by private enterprises now. Uh, so this is the privatization of a political sector, which I think is a sort of revolution. Uh, the financial market is a revolutionary power. 
it's privatized, simply privatized political power of states. And this is, by definition, a revolution. So uh, have a look on, on these markets and uh, call it simply revolutionary and uh, think about what might be, what do we, uh, what, uh, how can we deal with this uh, revolution. Hmm. And there are some revolutionaries and there are some winners of this revolution. Um, this is a big stream of privatization of political power, our political power. Uh, there was another question there. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a, a very... Uh... Considering everything that I've heard tonight, uh, corruption, is there a way to measure or has there been a way to measure corruption and how much impact does it have? Or even is the financial system based on corruption if it is not bound to gold in the first place? Is it just a monopoly game that everybody's just playing and everybody's just in it, <clears throat> stuck in it. So co corruption, I think, is a moral um, term. Mm -hmm. um, and if you transform it to an economic term, uh, and not a moral term, in this way we are all corrupt. Mm -hmm. um, um, but if you turn it into an um, economic term, it's not corruption, it's, it's exploitation. Um, so uh, the question should be, is there a system in which exploitation has a systematic position? And in this respect, I would say yes. So um, uh, even, um, and you ask the question, is there a difference between real economy and financial economy? You say, no, there is no difference. Because financial economy is directing or dictating the condition of the so-called real economy. This means production in Bangladesh, production in Pakistan, etc. Uh, uh, working prisons uh, for uh, the confection industry, etc. So, uh, uh, but this is not corruption, this is exploitation. Yeah? So the economic term for corruption is simply exploitation. And uh, this is, uh, can be described in a systematic, uh, in a systematic way. There was another question there. Yeah. So systemically, do you, see, and from a literary standpoint, do you see the emergence of new economic lines of thought beginning to influence both economic theory and our understanding of geopolitics under the nation-state system, and how? <clears throat> so was, was was it a question to politics, or was it a question concerning a theory? Question concerning the influence of people who write about geoeconomics mm. on economic theory and nation-state theory mm. in terms of geopolitics? Yes, I think so. I think so that uh, there is now a, a new uh, generation. I don't, uh, I'm not sure if you understood you correctly, uh, but I, I think there's a new generation describing uh, financial economy and this geoeconomic order, not in economical terms, but in terms of exercising power. And I think these are the most interesting impacts in theory now. Describing finance and describing global finance, not in economic terms, in market terms, but in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, executive uh, power. Uh, we can simply say uh, we are accustomed to have three powers. Uh, this means uh, juridical power, executive power and uh, the parliament, legislative power, and we must add a monetative power hmm, as a new branch of power, which is as important as the other branches of our um, uh, government. Mm -hmm. Do you have a comment or there was a hand there, I think? Yeah. yeah. I'm just surprised that uh, nobody talked about inflation in this. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that at the end of the very control system, but just after that, like, uh, slightly after that, then you had the oil crisis, and then you had a, a problem with inflation. The big problem of the economy at that time was controlling inflation and the uh, and, uh, stagnation, stagnation. But there was a big problem of inflation, and one of the reasons why you had the neoliberals uh, taking control of economic policies was that they, they provided a solution to the problem, and they managed to control inflation. Yeah. And then you have a lot of institutions which are created to be the aim of combating, controlling inflation, like the European Union, the European Central Bank, 
it's only one goal. The, the central bank, the euro, it's only one goal, three chips control the inflation, mm -hmm. monetary stability, and 2%, which nobody knows why 2%. Also, but they had this goal and only this goal. Yeah. It's also a very different goal. What the central banks are no <coughs> yeah. uh, We also know that inflation is actually uh, the biggest problem for, for the eternity for capital. <coughs> if you have high inflation, the capital will evaporate by itself <coughs> in other years. So, what are your ideas about this? <coughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think there are two sides uh, uh, concerning the question of uh, inflation. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you are completely right. The, the um, fight against inflation has a sort of, of historical memory, you know, uh, the 20s and the 30s, etc., and all the disaster which followed inflation. But uh, in the post-war politics, inflation was also, an, uh, uh, the fight against inflation was also an instrument uh, of a um, fight against trade unions. Because um, in this situation of fighting inflation, they created a new uh, concept, which is called natural unemployment. And this means mm -hmm. if the unemployment goes down to zero, this is the most dangerous sign of inflation because it, uh, it backs the trade unions, it raises salaries, so inflation control was control of salaries and not, for example, of uh, housing prices. Inflation was always linked to uh, salaries and the rise of salaries, but inflation did not, for example, even now, um, uh, have any respect to stock exchange prices or housing prices, etc. This was not uh, mentioned in the rates of inflation. First answer. Second answer, I think uh, now we have a completely different problem. So central banks, uh, for example, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, the European Central Banks, had a problem to create inflation because we had deflation in the last uh, years. So uh, the, um, uh, the cheap money, for example, was invented to create inflation. And this means to get back the control over society. Uh, last point, inflation control is and was after Second World War the best means and best instrument to control societies, to control employees, to control salaries. And now we have a situation where this control uh, is, um, um, mm -hmm. I, I think, um, uh, a little bit um, uh, disequilibrated. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I mean, I think the question of inflation brings a lot of these things. Uh, together and uh, and it's interesting how exactly yeah, there was this period how economic theory yeah follows our, our, our historic memory and then we think that the, the way it was the last time is how it's going to be be now uh, thinking okay, like we make this economic loss thinking like this happens so now we have to so yeah you know historically you would have the idea that yes central banks uh, create the money and if the central bank creates too much money uh, then you have inflation which is going to happen in uh, yeah, in other with huge uh, hyperinflation cases historically, and then you have uh, the stagflation of the nineteen seventies, uh, with that, with that when it was um, with that historical uh, period, and then you have the economic crisis coming now, and it's still this idea that oh, well, because now it's not central banks making money anymore; it's the private banks. So then the private banks were then not lending out money. Uh, because so that's why they that's why they were you know, filling up the banks with money through quantitative easing, but the problem was that at the same time, uh, other way I mean there are many ways that you get inflation. Also, for example, increasing wages. So when they were holding down the wages all they could in the economy, there was no the real economy was being held down. There was no purchasing power in the economy, uh, so that was being held down. So then they were trying to put money into the banks at the top, uh, and it did. I guess it worked maybe a little bit because you didn't get more deflation, but it definitely didn't work to increase inflation as, as you wanted to. Um, but I think if, if the question of the 70s, I would recommend uh, so my professor at the New School, Anwar Sheikh. He has a very interesting theory of uh, inflation, uh, saying that we have to really just understand it more of, of the, understand what state the productive capacity of the economy is at right now. Which it says depends a lot on, for example, the profitability in the, in the economy. And it has a lot to do with how far, how close you are to the max 
production possibility of, of your economy and how that can can vary a lot through time. And that's what you need to be looking at. So I would just recommend to yeah to look into these theories. Are there any other questions? No. Okay. Well, then I would like to thank you all for coming. Um, thanks to Yusuf and Eva, and I suggest that we thank them in the usual manner. <laughs> also, um, it's possible to buy this book, and I really recommend it. <laughs> Uh, we have a few copies here. Uh, I will go and get them, and you can. Uh, it's possible to use Vips, uh, but we don't have that many left. But you can get them online. Uh, just look up the book. And also, please become members of Rethinking Economics Norway. We're open for everybody. We're a network organization, not only students. So if you're interested in learning more about these uh, different ideas, uh, come. There's some notes lying around the seats, or check out, find us on Facebook, or just come talk to me. I'll be hanging around. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>